Um, welcome everybody. Good to have you here in this session and good to see so many uh, familiar people. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, so today, uh, Luca Gelsomino and me are going to talk about supply chain risk management and supply chain resilience a little bit. Uh, and the direct reason for that is that we did a, a research project on the Corona crisis. And of course, specifically about the impact of the Corona crisis on supply chains. Um, so who are we? Maybe good to start with that. If you can show me the next slide, Luca. Um, so my name is, is uh, Christian and I am a, a project manager at the Windesheim University of Applied Sciences for uh, large scale research projects. At the same time, I'm also doing research myself, uh, but also one day in the week I teach and I teach mainly on the topics of, uh, of supply chain finance. So where supply chain and finance meet each other, basically. Luca, can you introduce yourself? Of course. Thanks. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Luca Gelsomino. Uh, I am a colleague of Christian at, uh, at Bindesign University of Applied Sciences here in the Netherlands. I work on the topic of supply chain finance. I'm also involved in the supply chain finance community, a global organization that uh, we manage out of Bindesign, but it spans across multiple uh, universities and try to connect everyone that does research on supply chain finance with the industry of providers and uh, Chris, go ahead. Chris? Okay. Hello. Thank you. Yes. Bad connections. Yes, I, uh, I, uh, I, ca I cannot hear Luca very well. As, as Can sorry. the rest of the people hear me? Yes, okay, I see a thumb from, uh, from Wouter. So <laughs> I think uh, there was a problem with your audio, Luca, but I will, uh, I will continue. <laughs> um, if any problem happens with my audio, feel free to let me know, then I will, I will stop and, and we'll try to solve it. So as Luca said, we are always working at the intersection between uh, education, research and business, basically. That's what we do, and specifically on the topic of sp supply chain finance, of course. Um, can you give me the next slide? So about the research project we did. So uh, it was a large scale project um, focused on the impact of Corona on supply chains, but also the strategies that companies chose in response to Corona. Uh, and the main uh, way in which we collected data was a survey. So we did a survey and collected 339 answers uh, with a focus on Q2 quarter of, of 2020. So in here, you can see how, uh, well, what type of answers we got. So 38% uh, from the Netherlands, because we work in the Netherlands, but also from US, Germany, UK, um, so worldwide, but, but we're mainly focused on, on the European Union. Um, you can see some of the industries and um, you see that especially industries like retailing, manufacturing, uh, transportation, automotive and agriculture, they are, are well represented within our uh, uh, survey answers. And you can see the distribution among size of the companies that participated. So we had some SMEs, but the majority of the company were uh, larger companies, actually. Okay, can you, um, good to mention, by the way, is that we also did interviews in addition to, to the survey. So we did about 40 to 50 interviews to get more in-depth results uh, into this. Um, but today, it would, be, it would take way too much time to tell you, to give you all the detail. So we just uh, want to share uh, four key messages with you. And I think Luca can show them on the next slide. So first of all, we want to talk a little bit about revenues, how much uh, uh, and which industries were affected most in terms of revenues, impact of the crisis in terms of, uh, of raw material prices, access to supply, and the recalling of orders and, and cash needs, basically. Um, after that, Luca will uh, explain a bit more on the last two messages, which are about 
I think especially three and four are very interesting because there we will show which actions have actually been taken by companies. Um, and, and four is specifically about working capital. So the financial cash and liquidity perspective. Um, after that we show you these results, we basically want to start a discussion with you. So we want to ask you, hey, it's, it's, it's very clear from our results also, but in general news, you see it, that's the topic of supply chain risk management, and especially the topic of resilience in supply chains uh, is gaining a lot of attention. And for a good reason, if you, if you after Lucas showed us uh, uh, message three and four, you will understand why. Um, so we want to discuss with you, what does that mean for education? Do we need to throw every textbook out of the room? Do we need to write new textbooks? Do we need to start new courses? Or do we need to adapt existing courses? Uh, that's basically what we want to discuss with you at the end of the session. So keep those questions in mind when you, uh, oh, when you listen to our story. Okay, let's start with the uh, key message one. So in here, you can see the results from our survey and you see that uh, uh, the average decrease in revenues um, per industry. You see that most for most industries, the drop in, in revenues is in between zero and 10%. Um, however, there is one industry which really stands out which is really obvious uh, and that's automotive so they are almost at minus 35 uh, percent um, and that's a huge impact and and i think also from the the interviews we did uh, the ones with automotive were made the biggest impact on us because they uh, yeah they had some very um yeah bad stories especially in, in, in the second quarter of, of uh, 2020. Uh, not that many differences between SMEs and large companies, uh, by the way. However, I do have to say it's keep in mind that it's the second and the third quarter of 2020. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide and show you the impact of the crisis uh, in terms of a couple of, uh, of variables. So uh, first of all, we asked them, uh, the companies, can you access supply? And, and during the second quarter of, of 2020, you can see that was not really the biggest problem. Um, certain companies had some trouble in, in accessing supply, uh, but a lot of companies could find other suppliers very quickly already. So uh, if you compare that with fluctuation of prices of raw material, you see that a lot of companies faced these price fluctuations. Um, yeah, to give you an example, logistics prices in the last year have, uh, have been changing uh, constantly. So the price of a, of a container to ship goods from, from China to Rotterdam is uh, at almost at its highest point ever. Uh, and this, this is giving insecurity. Uh, but in a lot of industries, we see price fluctuations. Um, working capital needs, surprisingly, a lot of companies did not mention yet that they had direct troubles with working capital. Could also be because of government support, uh, of course, uh, because Luca will show you in, in the fourth message that there is a, a serious working capital impact as a result of Corona. Um, however, in, in the second quarter, it was not yet leading to serious problems, I would say. But Luca can reflect on that later on. Um, the last two are very interesting. So you see the recalling of orders. So recalling of orders to our suppliers or buyers are recalling orders, which means basically the canceling of orders. Um, and I showed you before that we had a lot of uh, out companies from the automotive industry who participated. And automotive is the, um, the best example here because in, in automotive, um, if, for example, uh, a, a large company like Volvo says we are, uh, we, we don't need it right now, we don't need car doors, or we don't need tires right now, they can cancel the order. It's in the contract. Basically, they say it's, it's a force majeure, and we cancel the order, and we don't need it right now, so you cannot um, deliver it to us. And what's going to happen is that the first tier supplier of Volvo or, or whatever car uh, or company you want to mention is also going to cancel uh, his or her orders to his or her supplier. 
So there's a complete supply chain effect of the cancellation of orders in, in this industry. Um, so not relevant for all companies, but uh, uh, for a lot of companies, the recalling of orders. Um, and depends, of course, on how, how strict are your contracts and, and what do you want to put in the contract and what not. Um, and, and how strict do you live up to the contracts? Um, yes, so um, as you can see also from the graph on the right side, that, that recalling of orders was very clear in, in automotive. Um, let's go to the, to the next slide, which is on bankruptcies. So we asked all the companies who participated if there were already suppliers that, uh, that bankrupted. Um, and as you can see by these numbers, um, well, this, this shows where did the bankrupted suppliers come from. But in general, there were not so many bankruptcies, uh, not in Europe and, and, and also not in other parts uh, of the world. And in, in the Netherlands, the, the clear reason for that was the government support. Um, so uh, perhaps the, the next slide will show that. Yes, there is. Um, so there is a delayed effect. And you can see here that there actually there was a reduction in bankruptcies in, in 2020. Um, and still, so this is a picture from 2020. So still in 2021, the amount of bankruptcies is, is, is lower than uh, what it used to be before uh, the Corona crisis. So government support, um, but also other reasons uh, for that. For example, it, it, uh, it takes more time for companies to, to, to uh, the, the companies who have to say, is this company bankrupt or not? They have to evaluate uh, all types of things and it takes them a longer period of time right now to evaluate companies. So if you want to declare bankruptcy, uh, it can take longer than before because the situation is simply more complex right now. That's another reason. Um, I would like to give the word to Luca to continue with the third message. In Thank you. Research. Sure. Okay, so moving forward, um, we asked companies in our survey, of course, what actions have you taken to respond to this, to this crisis? Uh, because of course you want to know how people, how companies reacted. We gave them 21 options, which you all see here. As you can see, uh, cannot go into the detail of every single one of them, but there's one that stands out uh, more than the others. The blue uh, part of the column is whether they adopted it one month after the crisis started, and that is forming a risk management team. That makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, basically, everyone that uh, responded to the survey, uh, close to 70%, uh, formed a risk management team in response to the crisis. And that's by far the action that everyone took. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, you can see, for example, outsourcing production, not uh, that common, and so on and so forth. We also said, well, okay, out of this pool of 21 uh, actions that were taken by companies. Can we somehow say uh, what uh, actions have been taken uh, immediately and what actions have been taken uh, later on? And uh, um, we, result we ended up with this chart that you can see uh, in the x-axis here and the horizontal axis, you, you have the actions, the number of people that, take, that took a specific action within the first month the y-axis, you see the number of people that took that same action after the first month from the uh, beginning of the crisis. And the former risk management teams is not in the chart, will be here outside on the chart of the, on the right because it's been taken by everyone immediately and by very few companies uh, after the first month. What do, and the color of the dot is goes from green to red. Green means that and this action has been taken on average by companies that have had an increase in their revenues as a consequence of the crisis. And then uh, uh, the full red means these actions have, this action has been taken by a company that had a decrease in revenues as a consequence of the crisis, while the intermediate color means either average 
or a mix of companies that are in both categories. What do we see out of this chart? Well, of course, you see uh, some very straightforward results. Uh, first of all, for example, uh, companies that have an increase in sale have increased their inventory level to cope for, for that increase in sale. You see it here, uh, most of them in the first month, but some of them even uh, later on after the first month uh, uh, of the crisis. What is less obvious, at least to us, is that uh, a lot of companies started to share more information. And this is true for both companies that did well and did not uh, well during, during uh, uh, the crisis, during the pandemic. And uh, we think that that's a kind of a positive sign because uh, uh, it's always uh, a bit difficult traditionally in a situation of uh, relative calm to increase and uh, foster collaboration and communication across the supply chain. Uh, if uh, uh, the pandemic has helped in this direction, that, that's definitely something that, that uh, we can be happy about uh, in these uh, very dark times. And uh, uh, with interviews, as Chris mentioned, we did a lot of interviews. We have uh, uh, talked with companies and they have confirmed that uh, they were ended up in a situation in which they had to start up sharing more information with suppliers and distributors, sometimes even uh, in a sort of uh, informal way because they didn't have the structure or the processes to do so in a structural way. We hope uh, and we have a bit of an idea that at some, at least a part of this information sharing across supply chain partner, partners will stay in, uh, in, um, in companies and will not go away. Uh, in 2022 or, or later on, uh, at least we hope. Uh, let's move forward. We also checked whether SMEs and large companies took the same number of actions. That is not the case. Statistically speaking, there is a significant difference between the number of actions that were taken by small companies and the number of actions that were taken by large companies. One side, this can be explained by the difference in the level of sophistication and complexity of large companies compared to small companies. Large companies have more complex supply chain, they face more issues and so on and so forth. On the other side, uh, this can also be kind of a, um, a warning sign that uh, SMEs uh, um, did not take the same, uh, were not able to take the same uh, to have the same reaction to the price that large companies had. And that is a potentially problematic sign when uh, the economy will, uh, will restart. We will, have, we will have to wait and see. And moving forward again, uh, we move to the fourth and last uh, key message, which is uh, working capital. Of course, we are a supply chain finance research group, so we cannot avoid uh, uh, looking into working capital. We ask companies, okay, did, uh, on top of any other thing that has happened during the pandemic, for the invoice that you have sent out, for the invoice that you have received, did you pay them in time? Were they paid in time? Or were they paid late? Or did you pay late? We uh, realized that on the buyer side, so getting invoice paid by customers, and more than 50% of the invoices that our respondents sent to their customers were paid late and 45% uh, 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 were paid uh, in time. Of course, that, that uh, uh, yeah, um, sorry. Uh, the, of these invoices that were paid late, uh, most of them were paid, uh, um, well, let's say uh, only for most companies that was a relatively limited amount of invoices. So 20% uh, uh, maximum, but for some companies there were a significant amount of invoices paid late. For example, if you look into the details uh, of, uh, of these, you can see, for example, in automotive, uh, the vast majority, more than 50% of invoices on average were paid late among the ones that were uh, actually paid and not excluding the orders canceled. And in terms of how late they were paid, uh, you can see um, more than 50% of the invoices were paid within 30 days late, some of them uh, more than that. Okay, that's interesting, but it's not 
the most interesting thing that you can say about this. The most interesting thing is if you take this information and try to place it in its supply chain uh, context. So we took uh, invoice pay late by buyers and invoice pay late to your own suppliers. And we said, okay, first of all, on average, what, you, what is the extension in a DPO and DSO? So time, time to collect invoices, time to pay invoices across the sample. And we saw, okay, 26 days for DSO and 23 days for DPO. That means across the sample of companies here that said, at I have at least some invoices that have been paid late. If you do the grand, grand, grand average, you get a 26 days of extension and a 33 days of extension towards suppliers. That means, seems like it's kind of, uh, um, it's kind of uh, canceling out, but actually it's not canceling out because if you go into the detail and you see where does this extension come from, you see that few companies that have, an ex that have to uh, bear a delay in payment from buyers are actually able to transfer that to suppliers. Most of them have to uh, incamerate it and uh, cover it with their own resource. And some companies are actually autonomously, and let's say not, uh, not as an input from their buyer, but they are paying their suppliers late as a reaction to the crisis. So these 26 days is usually not in companies that are extending payment terms towards their own suppliers. And the companies that are extending payment terms to their own suppliers usually do not face the same from their own buyers. It's a kind of distinct, uh, two distinct effects that are happening at the same time, which bring us to the typical uh, the typical uh, working capital behavior that you see in supply chain, which is that uh, when, when you have a buyer and a supplier, there is always one that is stronger than the other. And the one that is stronger is typically able to uh, get, get its way in terms of uh, how financial flow flows through the supply chain which means that uh, uh, if I am a strong buyer and there is a shock in my supply chain, I say, well, okay, I, I transfer to supplier. And if I am a strong supplier, then uh, uh, I say, well, okay, I do not accept uh, that my buyers pay late. Uh, that's what always happens. And that, that's also one of the reasons why supply chain finance is, uh, is critical when, uh, when this crisis happens. And that's everything I want to say. So I uh, move it back to Chris to, to continue. Okay, um, if you can give me the next slide. I have just two more slides uh, for you. So um, if you overhear everything what Lucas said about strategies used and how that changes over time and, and what companies are doing at the moment, then it is no surprise that, that the topic of, well, some people say supply chain risk management, some people say supply chain resilience. There's actually a lot of overlap between the two even though they are different, then uh, th th this topic is all over the news, basically. Um, so that is one thing we want to discuss. The next slide, and you see also on the other end of the other uh, slides, so you one back before we go, you see that um, a title called a financial crisis is looming for smaller suppliers from our colleagues at uh, Politecnico di Milano. Uh, and they basically extend on what Luca is saying and, and say, hey, these late payment terms can really turn supply chains upside down if the suppliers, as a result of not, not having cash anymore, can, for example, not produce anymore, then the buyer will also notice it. So uh, a financial crisis could be looming for smaller suppliers, especially because they have a weaker position in the supply chain. Um, just to show you that this financial element within resilience or supply chain risk management is often overlooked. That's also what, what Cagnato and, and uh, uh, Moyeto are, are, are saying, that this, this financial element, when we talk about supply chain risk management or resilience, we, we talk about the usual supply chain stuff, but please also don't forget the financial element. Um, which brings me to the last slide. And so the last slide, um, um, 
is something that we are considering as, as Windesheim University. And I think a lot of other people are also considering this. So these are questions that, well, we, we do not have a clear answer to this already. So that's why we want to discuss them with you, see which problems you are facing or what you are overthinking. Um, and uh, well, first of all, you see a question, what changes are needed in supply chain management education as a result of the Corona crisis, uh, but could also be, for example, the Suez Canal crisis um, or other of these big events. Uh, is supply chain risk management resilience already part of your education program? Very interested to hear something about that. And in, in case uh, that is the case, then is it a separate course for you or is that part of a bigger course? Um, and do you give attention to the financial perspective in supply chain risk management? Because of course, that's uh, what, what Luca and me could now can talk about for, for hours. Um, but we would like to hear your perspective. And I see that Jan is already uh, typing in the text box some interesting stuff. Um, so feel free to react to any of those questions, but maybe uh, good to start with Jan, Jan Janssen, because uh, he already, he's already saying some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, to be very modest, uh, I have one lecture about this topic in my course of supply chain finance based on the book of uh, supply chain risk management of uh, waters uh, and uh, added to that the the new version of the COSO ERM model and I use yeah yeah and I and I use also let's say annual reports of for instance uh, Philips where they have a separate section about risk management and then you see also the impact on uh, supply chain management but also on risk management in terms of finance. Okay, so you are you are you are already using this uh, uh, in your lectures? Yeah, only a small lecture of three hours, so not that much, but uh, yeah. Are, are you considering uh, to uh, to make this a bigger part of of, uh, of education? Do you think we should do that in general? Uh, my my humble opinion in that way is yes, I think so. It's important not only for a course of supply chain finance, but in general for supply chain management, to be aware, more aware of the risks in the supply chain. And I think that is, as far as I know from our university, uh, the Dutch stream, not that much in the, in the program, but I think it, it should have a place there. Mm -hmm. Okay, very clear, uh, Jan. Thank you very much for your contribution. Um, is there anyone else who would like to mention something uh, about this? I have uh, one question. Uh, this is Arjit from India. Uh, hi. Uh, see, uh, basically, uh, when we teach uh, supply chain finance part in India, we focus more on cash to cash cycle and, you know, some of the financial ratio. Uh, now, have you done any study which reflects on this particular thing? Because here, what is happening, it's, of course, our limitation. Uh, to some extent that uh, students uh, cannot understand the overall financial perspective of supply chain in some cases i found maybe my limitation maybe students limitation forget about that but the, the question is that they, they simply look to the ratios and try to interpret something that okay the cash to cash cycle you know uh, changes and uh, some companies are doing good like amazons and those things these guys are doing good in this particular scenario whereas some of the other company heavy manufacturing and all those things they are a little bit bleeding Okay, so uh, have you done any specific studies? This is just a, you know, question. Yes, um, I think Luca can answer this uh, question, but uh, if you look into his, his, his slide on, uh, uh, his last slide he showed, it's actually about the cash to cash uh, cycle, except that in this specific research, we didn't look for, for inventories and, and days inventory outstanding. Yeah, indeed. So we, we look into the payment terms. Uh, that, that this yeah. specific research project was not specifically about supply chain finance. Uh, so we didn't uh, talk about uh, the the cash to cash cycle in all of its component uh, because otherwise the, the survey gets too long and uh, you, you don't get any answer. 
but we have this small, uh, small, uh, um, small finding about it uh, based on the questions that we were able to put in. We, we don't have right now a cash-to-cash -cash analysis of uh, the impact of on the impact of COVID, but uh, it's an interesting point. I don't know if if anyone has uh, been interested in seeing it. Yeah, that's why I loosely put forward the question. I know that your research has certain, you know, uh, focus and implications, uh, but this is how we teach. That's why this is uh, no problem. Uh, fine. Okay, thank you for your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. A nice presentation, by the way. <laughs> thanks a lot. Quite insightful. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions or remarks? Let's take a look. Okay, I think uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, I think that we just uh, gave you 15 minutes extra break, right? Uh, perhaps Wouter can, can tell us a little bit more uh, about uh, uh, the next sessions. <coughs> okay, I think that's it for today then for our session. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation. Feel free to, to link with us uh, or to if you want to exchange ideas about supply chain finance or risk, supply chain risk management, feel free to connect with us. And I think LinkedIn is the easiest way, but you could also send, uh, send us an email. Um, so, okay, good to see all of you and uh, hope to see you in the rest of the day.